Hi, I'm Pat Nelligan and welcome to this series of tutorials on mechanical ventilation. These tutorials were designed to be watched in sequence, so start at the beginning and work your way through. The first series that I've put together are on setting up a mechanical ventilator. These are a series of four tutorials on setting up a mechanical ventilator, and these are the fundamentals that you must know before we start even talking about vent modes. First point I want to make is that mechanical ventilators are flow generators. They generate and control the flow of gas into the patient. This is an example of some of the material we'll be covering. On the top is a ventilator, there's some tubing, there's lungs, and there's a control and measurement screen. And the ventilator triggers, and we'll talk in an entire tutorial about how ventilators trigger and a breath is generated. That may be a volume control breath or a pressure control breath or a completely unsupported breath. And then gas flows into the lungs and that flow is always positive. So there's a flow waveform that can be generated from that. The lungs then expand and the tidal volume and an airway pressure is measured. In this case, the tidal volume is 450 mils and the airway pressure is positive. It's 15 centimeters of water. Depending on how you set up the ventilator, the ventilator will cycle to exhalation and the gas that has been sent into the lungs is now released and it is vented off through an exhalation valve. So when we're setting up a ventilator, we need to first determine the control mechanism, volume or pressure. The flow pattern, sinusoidal, that looks like a sine wave, constant or decelerating, the triggering mechanism, how the ventilator knows when to give a breath. And that can be a time trigger, it can be a pressure trigger, or it can be a flow by trigger. And finally, the cycling mechanism, how the ventilator goes from inspiration to exhalation. For example, that could be time, it could be volume, or in some locations, it's pressure. So this is tutorial one control mechanisms. This time I will, I will discuss the different control mechanisms on mechanical ventilators, but they really fall into two generalized uh, concepts. The first is volume control ventilation, where a tidal volume is given to a patient and the airway pressure is variable. And then there's pressure control ventilation, where the airway pressure is targeted and the tidal volume is variable. And there is a version of this known as dual control, which is gar volume guaranteed pressure control. A control refers to how the flow is delivered and targeted. The ventilator modes are volume control, pressure control, or dual control. And um, um, this is the first thing you really need to decide when you're setting up a ventilator. And on this particular screen here, you can see under control is pressure control, volume control, and volume guaranteed pressure control. In this tutorial, I'm going to use a model of a very basic mechanical ventilator. And what you're seeing on the screen here, following from the right to the left, we have a gas supply, usually oxygen and air, a gas blender to ensure that the inspired oxygen tension is as you want it, a ventilator, and in this case, the ventilator is a simple bag in the bottle, like what you saw a little bit earlier on. That will be familiar to anyone who's worked in the operating room um, that requires a control unit uh, with the ventilator controls. These may be knobs or screen controls. Uh, there's an observation screen uh, that reports the dynamics of ventilation, particularly tidal volume and airway pressure, a gas outlet, um, a delivery tubing, and an airway, in this case an endotracheal tube for simplicity. And finally, a gas outlet um, out of the patient and an exhaust pipe that scavenges the gas out into the environment. Let's start with volume control ventilation. In volume control ventilation, one has specific settings that one needs to make. The most important one of these is, of course, the tidal volume. 
you also need to set a respiratory rate and that tells the ventilator when to deliver a breath and how many breaths a minute the patient should get. The ventilator also needs to know when it should cycle into expiration. And what, that, what I mean by that is how the ventilator knows when to turn off a breath or exhale. And this can be achieved either with an inspired to expired ratio that's known as the I to E ratio. And how you figure this out is you divide the respiratory rate into 60. For example, if you have 15 breaths, there will be one breath every four seconds. And then you divide the length of each breath, the I to E ratio into the length of each breath. So if you have a one to three I to E ratio, you'll have one second of inspiration and, four, uh, and three seconds of expiration in that four second window. The alternatives to the ITE ratio are to set a specific inspiratory time, for example, a second or a second and a half, or set a peak inspiratory flow like 50 to 60 litres, and the ventilator just cycles once the breath has been delivered. And I'll talk about this in detail in the next tutorial on volume control ventilation. In this case, we're, we've decided to give a tidal volume of 420 mils. The rate may be 12 to 15 breaths per minute with an ITE ratio of 1 to 3. So the ventilator is going to now deliver that breath. It goes into the patient. It causes the lungs to expand. And you will notice that the tidal volume that's measured on the screen below the ventilator is the same tidal volume as we have dialed up on the settings. Um, that tidal volume should always be the same because it's volume control ventilation and you're targeting that tidal volume. Um, the airway pressure that's being measured here is 15 centimetres of water. Now I want to make a point that's really important here about exhalation. When the ventilator cycles to exhalation, the gas is released by elastic recoil back to the base lung volume. That's the functional residual capacity. Now, it's important to remember this. Although we measure the inspiratory airway pressure, that's the airway pressure on that little screen there, the tidal volume is always measured in exhalation. That is the amount of gas that's ventilated out of the patient. We're looking to match the number that we've put up on the inhalation side with what's coming out on the exhalation side. The reason for this is that what we set by the ventilator is the desired tidal volume. But if there are leaks in the system, that may not be delivered. So the more accurate measurement is what actually comes out of the patient. So again, in volume control ventilation, a tidal volume goal is set. That means the ventilator will generate a flow of gas onto the tidal volume target. In this case, 450 mils is achieved. Once that's been achieved, inward flow will stop. At this point, we can measure the airway pressure at end inspiration. And that, that pressure is variable in volume control. The pressure is measured in centimetres of water. And in this case, the airway pressure is 20 centimetres of water for a set tidal volume of 450 mils. Now, there are a bunch of different volume control modes, but generally they fall into three. One is where you just see volume control ventilation. I don't really believe that pure volume control is built into any modern anesthetic machines or ICU ventilators. Usually they have a fudge in there for what happens when the patient starts to breathe spontaneously um, because you have to have some way of assisting the patient. And the reason why this is important is that if a patient starts to breathe and the ventilator simultaneously delivers a controlled breath, those breaths could be stacked one on top of the other, causing an enormously large tidal volume. And that can cause cause significant volume trauma to the lungs. So the most common mode of ventilation in the volume side of things is volume assist control ventilation that I will talk about in detail in the next talk. For many years, synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation was very popular, particularly in Europe, although it's less popular now, it's still a valid mode of ventilation. The major advantages of volume control ventilation work like this. In my view, when a patient arrives in the ICU, there's usually a lot of activity. 
putting in lines, drawing up infusions, positioning the patient, putting on sequential compression devices, inserting urinary catheters, starting renal replacement therapy, talking with the the, the family, talking to the primary care team, talking to various different consultants. The last thing the bedside nurse or the care practitioner needs is to be making dynamic adjustments to the ventilator or even watching it continuously. And that is the major benefit of volume control ventilation. The tidal volumes are locked in. Why is that a huge volume? Well, first of all, because you've locked in the tidal volume, there is no risk of excessive lung stretch um, um, by because you're limiting the tidal volumes. There's no risk that the patient's going to take massive tidal volumes because they're being told how to breathe and how big their breaths are. The second thing is the tidal volumes are guaranteed even if the patient's position and lung mechanics change, particularly during surgery, but in someone who is waking up and their atal is recovering, their tidal volumes will still uh, stay the same. And I'll just talk about that a little bit in a few minutes. Also, the arterial CO2 levels can be really tightly controlled, and that is really important in brain-injured patients or patients who have just undergone neurosurgery. The major drawback of volume control modes of ventilation is that they are flow limited. We're going to talk about flow in the next tutorial, but I do need to mention it here and now. The rate of gas flow is usually set on an ICU ventilator by the operator. This is known as the peak flow or the V with the little dot over it, max, the flow max. That is the velocity of flow at the very beginning of the breath, at the start of the breath. It's a strength and it's a limitation of volume control ventilation. In this particular picture, you can see here the patient, um, the, there's a, a pressure waveform on the top and a flow waveform on the bottom. Don't worry if you're not recognizing these waveforms yet. We're going to talk a lot about waveforms later in this course. But just in case you've seen uh, waveforms before, you can see here there's three breaths here. These are assisted breaths and the patient is scooping out these breaths. They're volume controlled. Um, uh, constant flow breaths, but the patient is triggering the breath but not getting sufficient flow. So during these spontaneous assisted breaths, the patient has demand flow dyssynchrony or air hunger. That's the big disadvantage of volume control. The other thing that you need to be a little bit aware of in volume control is this situation here. Now, we have a patient who is undergoing surgery, for example, and we've set a tidal volume of 420 mils. In this case, the patient has really poor chest wall compliance. That means that the chest wall does not expand when the lungs expand. And this can happen, for example, if you've insufflated the abdomen with carbon dioxide during a laparoscopic operation, or the patient has very, very distended bowels or is profoundly constipated, or their chest has been wrapped in very, very tight dressings, the lungs just won't expand. In this situation, the ventilator will always try and uh, deliver the tidal volume. Uh, and the consequence of that is that the airway pressure may turn out to be very high. In this case, you can see that the airway pressure is 45 centimeters of water. That is not necessarily harmful where the chest wall mechanics are poor, but it is a problem because if you set an airway pressure pop-off alarm before this level, the tidal volume may not be delivered. So just keep this in mind. If you're if you're doing big laparoscopic procedures like robotic prostatectomies, you need to look at that airway pressure pop-off um, number and make sure it's above that point. My view is if you have a patient coming into the ICU or in the operating room who is paralyzed with neuromuscular blockers such as cishatrocurium or rocuronium, well, there is very, very few reasons for not using volume control ventilation. It just works. It's really reliable. It does what it says. It gives the tidal volumes. It controls the CO2. And it's really, really, really reliable. Now let's move on to pressure control. In pressure control, we set an inspiratory pressure. That's our target pressure at end inspiration. It's the driving pressure above baseline, for example, the positive end expiratory pressure or just atmospheric pressure. We also set a respiratory rate so the ventilator knows when to cycle to inspiration. And then we set an inspiratory time so that the ventilator knows when to cycle to exhalation. In this case, I've set an inspiratory pressure 
of 15 centimetres of water, a respiratory rate of 12, and an inspiratory time of one second. So the ventilator is going to discharge and generate a flow of gas into the lungs up to an airway pressure of 15, and it's going to hold that um, gas in the lungs for one second. And you can see here that the airway pressure is 15 centimetres of water and the exhaled tidal volume is 420 mils. When the inspiratory time has elapsed, the airway pressure is released and gas flows out of the lungs. Again, airway pressure is measured on inspiration and tidal volume on exhalation. In pressure control ventilation, the key thing to understand is that you're setting an airway pressure goal. And in this case, for example, this is 20 centimeters of water. That's 15 above the PEEP. So that is the driving pressure, is the pressure difference between the PEEP, the positive end expiratory pressure, and the, um, and the, the um, inspiratory pressure. That's 20 centimeters of water. So the driving pressure here is 15 centimeters of water. Um, on invasive ventilators, driving pressure is always above PEEP. This is not always the case on non-invasive ventilators. And once the driving pressure has been uh, delivered and the inspiratory pressure has been achieved, a tidal volume will register, in this case, 450 mils, again, on exhalation. In pressure control modes, the tidal volume is variable and it varies from breath to breath depending on lung compliance patient positioning and patient ventilator interaction. So the time, tidal volume can vary very, very significantly over time. There are lots of pressure control modes. The most commonly used pressure control mode is pressure assist control ventilation. There's also an SIMV version of pressure control. Um, there is pressure support ventilation about which we will do a full tutorial. There's a modification of that known as proportional assist ventilation, which is apparently uh, supposed to help uh, patients wean from the ventilation, although it's quite fiddly to use. And then there's another mode known as bi-level, sometimes uh, bi-level airway pressure, bi-level CPAP, bi-vent, BiPAP. I just call this mode bi-level pressure control. I think it's the best way to describe it. Um, and all of these different modes, what makes them different isn't the control breath, but in fact how the patient themselves interact with the machine. The, on the surface, pressure control ventilation is a huge advantage because it's really physiological. The thoracic pump is a negative pressure ventilator and pressure control modes mimic this, particularly when the patient is breathing spontaneously. There is also really precise control over mean airway pressures that can be achieved by adjusting the inspiratory time. The patient is also really unlikely to develop um, demand flow dyssynchrony because flow is essentially unlimited because there is a large negative pressure ramp. However, there are some issues. Uh, this is the same patient with poor chest wall compliance who is receiving pressure control ventilation. Again, the example I used before in volume control is a patient who is having um, laparoscopic surgery. But anything that stops the chest wall from moving, even severe obesity, um, is, is a problem. Um, as you have set a pressure limit, when the patient, uh, um, the, the ventilator drives the patient's lungs up to that inspiratory pressure, the tidal volume will always be variable. But if the chest wall does not move out as you expect, that tidal volume may be really, really disappointing and the patient might significantly hypoventilate. This might appear to you be really, to be really obvious from the offset, but it isn't necessarily. Because imagine if you're doing a case of a laparoscopic colectomy in the operating room and you start off the patient on pressure control ventilation and the driving pressure is 15 centimeters of water. They're getting 450 mil tidal volume. And you're happy with this and the end tidal carbon dioxide is within your um, desired range. As that um, abdomen becomes insufflated progressively with carbon dioxide, the chest wall elastance increases and it become, the wall becomes much less compliant 
and the airway pressure that's required to lift those lungs and the chest wall at the same time increases. So the tidal volumes may drop significantly during the course of that operation. That will cause hypercarbia, but remember at the same time they're insufflating carbon dioxide and a lot of that is absorbed. So you may get a really, really severe respiratory acidosis. And that is the reason why if I'm doing laparoscopic surgery, I always use volume control ventilation. The, the major disadvantages of pressure control are as follows. The tidal volumes are variable. They may be too large, resulting in hyperinflation of the lungs. So, for example, a patient who um, may have very non-compliant lungs who's taking modest tidal volumes is giving um, a dose of furosemide. They have a brisk diuresis and suddenly their lungs open up. They may go from a tidal volume on the same driving pressure of from 400 mils to maybe 800 mils. The tidal volumes may be too small, resulting in the buildup of carbon dioxide. And although inspiratory dyssynchrony is rare, it can happen. And expiratory dyssynchrony, where the breath is too long or too short, is a real problem with all pressure control modes of ventilation. As a consequence of this, when, you know, pressure control has some advantages over volume control, particularly with gas distribution, patient comfort, but clinicians, you know, may be very concerned that the tidal volume targets may not be reached, resulting in hypoventilation and hypocarbia. Um, and this may result from position alterations, changes in lung mechanics, intra-abdominal pressure, etc. So pressure control requires really continuous vigilance by the bedside healthcare professional. And, you know, there are very busy people, there's a lot going on, maybe you're not continuously looking at the ventilator. So-called dual control modes were developed to resolve these issues. These modes can be really viewed as one mode, which is volume guaranteed pressure control, regardless of what the vent manufacturer calls it. Using these modes, one sets a target tidal volume and a pressure limit, but it's mostly the target tidal volume. Um, what the ventilator does, it typically delivers a few breaths or maybe just one volume control breath with an inspiratory pause. Uh, and it looks at the airway pressures and the resistance and the mechanics. And then it adjusts the inspiratory flow and inspiratory time to ensure that the tidal volume has been achieved. So it really is, um, even though you set a tidal volume target, it's really pressure control ventilation. And... The tidal volumes are guaranteed, but they're not limited. Just because you dialed up 450 mils does not mean that the patient will not, for example, get 470 mils intermittently or 430 mils. It's generally in and around the ballpark, and it's very, very safe for most patients in the ICU. And you can pretty much put people on this mode and not pay too much attention to the ventilator unless you're really worried about tight control of carbon dioxide. So it's a nice novice mode of ventilation to use, and it works pretty well. On different ventilators, there's different versions of this. There's volume assist control with auto flow on the Draeger ventilators. There's pressure regulated volume control on the McQuay ventilators. But they'll also have on the McQuay ventilators or the servo ventilators, there's a mode where even on volume control, they'll give the patient a little bit of pressure support if they um, start kind of breathing, uh, taking more, demanding more flow than the ventilator is willing to deliver. It's called VC plus on the Puritan Bennett uh, ventilator. And there is a, a mode on some of the ventilators, which is essentially volume, gar volume guaranteed pressure support or volume support ventilation. So the major advantages of volume guaranteed pressure control. Generally, these modes ensure that the patient receives an approximation of the required tidal volume. And this resolves the attention issue. Also, because it's essentially flow augmented, because it's pressure control, the patient is really comfortable and they are not going to have problems with demand flow dyssynchrony on inspiration. And they, the mode is far, far less likely to cause problems with peak pressure alarms and failure to trigger the ventilator than volume control. There are a couple of disadvantages with this mode. First of all, Tidal volumes are variable and they are not precise. You can see from this screenshot that the desired tidal volume here is 470 mils, but the patient is only exhaling 442 mils, and that is a 10% shortfall. Sometimes the same patient may receive 520 mils. So the, while the mode is relatively safe, it's not about precision. 
Be aware that there is another pressure control mode known as bi-level pressure control, and I'm not going to mention it right now. I will discuss this in details in the tutorial on modes of ventilation and pressure control ventilation. But before finishing this first tutorial, let's vent, uh, visit the ventilator screen. The modern mechanical ventilator features a screen that contains lots of digital and graphical information. All of this information is useful and a competent clinician must be able to interpret both the numbers and the waveforms. During this course, I will emphasize both, but I will particularly reference waveforms as I believe that this is often a major weakness for ICU clinicians. One would not assess cardiovascular function in the ICU without looking at the heart rate number, the ECG, the blood pressure number, and if available, the blood pressure waveform. So if the information is on the screen in the ventilator, you need to know what the screen means. This is the screen that you see on the Puritan Bennett 980 series ventilator. It's similar to all modern ventilators. The current settings are on the bottom of the screen. On the top of the screen, you'll see a limited number of what I call ventilator numbers. These represent dynamic measurements of breath rates, tidal volume, lung compliance, respiratory resistance, airway pressures, etc. The C number there just means that the current breath is a controlled breath. If it's an assisted breath, an A is seen there and a spontaneous breath, an S is seen there. Um, spontaneous breaths include pressure supported breaths. Below this, I have split the screen. On the left, you will see the standard ventilator waveforms for pressure for volume and for flow. On the left, you can observe the spirometry curves, pressure volume curves and flow volume curves. And I find flow volume curves particularly useful. And I will explain in later tutorials why these are so useful. It is my view that the best way to look at a ventilator screen is to display the waveforms primarily, not the numbers. I do this whether or not I'm in the ICU or the operating room. The standard waveforms are pressure, flow, and volume. If you're only going to pick two of them, it would be pressure and flow. You must have um, a flow waveform. The essential numbers, if you need numbers, are inspired oxygen tension, that's FiO2, PEEP, positive end expiratory pressure, the respiratory rate, which is the breath frequency, the peak pressure, the lung compliance, if it's measured, and the resistance. And these are the typical waveforms that you may see in a patient on volume control ventilation as in the previous screenshot and how I will illustrate waveforms in subsequent tutorials. On the top is the airway pressure. It's usually positive and it's measured in centimeters of water. In the middle is flow, which is positive during inspiration and negative during expiration. And on the bottom is tidal volume in mils. Even though the flow and pressure waveforms look different here, the tidal volumes are the same, and that is characteristic of volume control ventilation. So what I've covered so far is mechanical ventilators and the control of those ventilators. And mechanical ventilators are volume controlled, pressure controlled, or dual controlled, which is volume guaranteed pressure control. I've also briefly mention the ventilator screen, its layout, and the typical waveforms that you look at. Next time, I will discuss sinusoidal flow patterns, constant flow patterns, and decelerating flow patterns. Don't forget to move on to the next tutorial and subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube.